so just a little bit about me. I am classically trained in the dark arts of computer science. Um, I did that for a bachelor's degree at the great fine University of California, uh, Riverside, which is also a citrus-based university. I don't know why these oranges keep following me. Um, then I went on to uh, further go down the rabbit hole of the dark arts, and I entered into electrical engineering for a master's degree, uh, specifically working on GPS navigation and uh, vehicle um, control using um, inertial navigation systems as well. Then um, I became a failed, or aka challenged, founder um, of several companies that all crashed and burned. Uh, and uh, the only thing that I did that was somewhat successfully was I consulted for a while um, using my software skills to help people manage their social media. And then um, one of uh, my old college friends started this thing called SendGrid and um, joined that about six months in as the fifth employee and um, have worn many hats since then. Uh, but really, you know, why I'm here is because I've become this, the septilingual member of the maintainerati. <laughs> Fancy talk for the crazy man who tries to maintain seven different languages across 20-some um, repos. Um, so how my journey started here, um, I'm going to blame Tim Falls. He's the one who started our developer relations program at SynGrid. And when he um, gave the presentation of what developer relations was, so yes, want to do that. That seems awesome. I will travel the world and write code. That seems amazing. So did that. Um, got burned out after about two years. Um, spent a lot of time traveling, and so I was looking at what can I do next. So I it was in a holding pattern as a hacker in residence for a while, where I basically did the same thing a DevRel folks do, except without the travel. And then finally, um, Matt came on board and um, switched from docs into this role of developer experience and started this idea of we can have someone that can focus on the SDKs full time. So prior to that, as a DevRel team, we all shared that responsibility in our quote unquote free time. We'd all kind of just jump in whenever we could. But now for the first time, we'd have someone, me, <laughs> to focus on just the SDKs. So, um, these are the core client SDKs that SynGrid focuses on. These are the famous seven languages. You may notice that one of your favorite languages, Perl, is not on there. And that's just mainly because I don't have the required beard, so they said I cannot <laughs> touch Perl. So I decided, OK, fine, I'll take these seven. But um, really what we did is we looked at the volume of mail traffic going through and found that these were the top seven ones that were used. And so we had to make a cutoff at some point. And so these were the, the top seven um, that are used. Now there's billions of emails that flow through these SDKs per month. So it's no pressure. Um, so you may have seen this picture earlier when Cristiano um, tore apart our stuff. And, uh, uh, that's how I felt when I looked at this challenge. I literally scoffed at the challenge and said, we can do this. Actually, I went into the fetal position for several weeks and Matt had to come get me. <laughs> he said, man, we gotta do this. Okay, 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 we'll do this. So um, our first job is we needed to take, um, we had these uh, 233 some odd endpoints and uh, we had a V2 SDK uh, code base that only supported one endpoint. So we needed to figure out how can we support all of the endpoints in this new version of our API across seven languages. And so we got out a spreadsheet, because that's what we do, we estimate things. And we estimated it would take over eight years to do this by hand. And so obviously, <laughs> that's not acceptable. Um, and, and you know our managers did not have that face. <laughs> like, no, it's going to take eight years to do that. Um, and so, uh, obviously, the question became to automate or not to automate. Obviously, that question is pretty obvious. Of course, we have to automate. But the deeper question is what to automate. And that's what I'm going to go through in this talk and hopefully save you some time and tell you some things that we've learned in terms of what should be automated, what shouldn't be, what should be lovingly crafted by hand. Um, and we looked at some things, you know, the classical questions about build versus buy, and in our case, buy meant open source tools. You know, uh, Open API, Swagger at the time, had a ton of auto generation tools. There were some companies that were just getting started. API Matic was one of them that was uh, generating um, client libraries. So we're like, why don't we just do that and be done? So we did a lot of research, and what we found out is that um, 
we needed to build our own solution. Um, and we, there was a certain level of control that we wanted, and we wanted to be able to move a little bit faster than what we thought we could do with the automated solutions. And so ultimately, we decided to build on top of Open API. That became our holy grail. That became the specification to end all specifications. Um, and that became possible through our friends at stoplight.io. They made it very easy for us to define things in a graphical way and then spit out the Open API spec for us so we didn't have to tediously do all of this by hand. So they saved us a ton of time, especially through their auto discovery thing where you, you set up your um, website as a proxy and you just start clicking around and they start capturing all the API calls for you. Then you just need to go in and fill in the details. That saved us a tremendous amount of time. Really, really big um, savings there. Um, of course, um, you know, we stole from the best. We looked at uh, companies like Stripe and Twilio. We looked at where, where everyone was saying the, these people nailed it, and we looked at them. We did tons of research. By the end of the day, we had to roll up our sleeves and, and get going. And so what we discovered is, um, you know, the first thing we looked at was, uh, okay, what are the things that we can um, automate here? So general documentation became an easy one because with the open API spec, um, you're able to put in a lot of information. We can store the documentation in there, and then it made it so that we can simultaneously generate documentation and a bunch of other code, and um, I'll get to uh, some other stuff we uh, document a little bit later. Um, but open API became our single source of truth. Um, for integration tests, another shout out to our friends at stoplight.io. If you uh, hand them over a um, open API spec and give them, uh, they have a service called Prism. What it does is it spies on Americans. Oh no, that's wrong Prism. Um, no, no, this, <laughs> this Prism actually what it does is something really cool. It um, takes your open API spec and makes a mock server. This is huge because before what I was doing, and I had gone through two languages to do this, is I was figuring out the mocking mechanism for each language and then having to define that was really tedious and painful. Now, I didn't have to do that. I had one central source of truth. It spun up a fake SynGrid. And then now we have that running in Docker. For example, if you contribute to our Python library, you download a Docker image. We spin up the mini fake SynGrid in there, and then you can just get started without API key. You just get going, making API calls, and we provide all the samples and everything. Um, also, when we push code up to um, GitHub, uh, we run Prism in there, and so we do the integration test in there without having to do any kind of hand mocking across all the languages. We just have one source of, source of truth for that. Um, so uh, examples, so that same uh, open API spec allows us to create cut and paste examples, like some of the ones that you saw earlier, where you just go in and say, okay, I wanna call this endpoint to get all my statistics for you know, between this month and that month. So we generate all of that code for you. Um, the low level code, so I'm talking about the code that you use just to make the basic API call. So I'm gonna get um, into the helper code a little bit later, the code on top of that that obfuscates some of the details, but just the low level code, you can totally automate that with the open API. Um, one of my favorites is um, the CLA, the Contributor License Agreement. So you know, once you start growing up a little bit, the legal um, department will come to you and say, hey, people need to start signing some legal stuff so that we don't uh, lose all this hard work that we've done. And we've had some bad experiences. Um, uh, personally, I had to do a pull request uh, for some Azure docs. I got super excited because it was on GitHub. I was like, cool, make a PR on Azure. It's going to be amazing. And then once I tried to do the PR, it said that I needed to get my CLA co-signed by legal counsel and I had to fax it in. I was like, this must be punishment for Microsoft engineers that break builds. They have to man the fax machine. <laughs> I don't know. But um, then our good friend um, Ed Zaneski, who used to be a DevRel a partner of ours, who handed the, um, the uh, SDKs to me before he left, um, he was going to do a pull request. And he saw that we pr needed a CLA. And he said, uh, you guys aren't Facebook. <laughs> And so I said, okay, I'm going to see what Facebook does. And I looked at Facebook, and to contribute there, all you need to do is fill out an online web form, authenticate with GitHub, and you're done. 
I said, I want that. And so began to investigate, and we found a service called cla-assistant.io. It's open source, uh, written by SAP, and it allows you to do that magic. And it, it's fully integrated with uh, GitHub. So now if you come to our repo and you make a pull request, an uh, auto-generated comment will come, and it will say, hey, you need to sign the CLA, provided you hadn't signed it before. And then once you click the button to sign it, you get a simple customized form, authenticate with GitHub, and then boom, now you can contribute. We have the record of the transaction. The comment gets updated saying that the person has signed the CLA and ready to rock and roll. Um, that saved us so much time because our previous method, they'd have to actually download a PDF, sign it, and then email it back to us. Marginally better than faxing stuff. Um, swag, so we love to swag people because we have these nice, fancy, soft, unicorn skin shirts. They are fantastic and people love them. But the problem is, is to give them to people via our open source repos was very tedious. We'd have to have a spreadsheet. They'd have to email us their personal information. Then I have to enter in the spreadsheet. Then I have to send out an order. Highly irritating. Uh, it made me not want to swag nobody out. <laughs> it's like, no swag for you. Um, but then we discovered um, our partner, who also does the swag for Hacktoberfest. Um, their name is Kotis, K-O-T-I-S. They provide an API for their swag. Ooh, swag as a service, love that. So uh, now what we do, if someone merges a pull request and then uh, we look to see that we haven't sent them swag previously, they authenticate with GitHub, we check and match that they belong to that pull request, and then they get a form that they fill out with their information, and then, that, then we get an email saying, hey, somebody's requesting to be swagged, and then we verify it, click, yeah, they're, they're cool, they can have swag, and then the API call is sent, and then magically one of our shirts, a sticker and a hacker pin shows up at their door. It's really amazing, so now, I, you know, you want swag, the swag is, uh, it's all for you. <laughs> um, let's see, so then uh, get, the last thing is the GitHub interaction. So GitHub has a wonderful webhook mechanism and so we've, it, we've uh, automated a whole bunch of things around webhooks. So when someone opens a PR, opens an issue, when they make a comment, when we label things, like a quick example is um, if someone puts an issue that's clearly a support issue, I can just put a tag that says support and then we'll automatically send a comment directing them to our support channel. So before I used to you know, use a text expander snippet and do this by hand, you know, it took a couple seconds but it became annoying, it's a lot faster just to apply a tag and then later if I need to change that template um, anyone in the in the company that has um, ability to change those tags can do it um, so those things yes automate so what should you not automate um, well the HTTP client so one of the things we were looking at is when we did a um, kind of a an inventory of what we currently had, we found that we had a lot of dependencies. And right around that time, the whole left pad thing happened. And so we were thinking, how can we, like while we have the hood up, how can we go in there and, and fix some things? And one of the things we decided is that we were going to try whenever possible to use the native um, HTTP clients. That way we wouldn't have any um, dependency issues. This was particularly troublesome for languages like PHP where we were using things like Guzzle. And then we'd get people sending us things, say, well, your Guzzle doesn't work on Symfony version 5.7 and all this stuff, and it's like, you know what, <sighs> it's too much. So we decided, you know, we're just gonna use the um, native clients, because our API is pretty simple. We don't need a lot of the advanced functionality, and the advanced functionality we need, well, we'll build it as needed. And so um, that's what we did, and so uh, I believe that you should lovingly craft your HTTP clients whenever possible. The only language this was not possible in was Java, because Java doesn't believe in patch, apparently. They decided will not fix, will not implement patch. Uh, so that was kind of strange. So most people use the Apache client there, and so do we. Um, the helpers, so I mentioned the low-level code. So the next level is you wanna create wrappers around that code to make it super easy. Like the code that Cristiano showed in Ruby, that actually is not the final state. That's more like the lower-level code. We're actually working on revamping all of our uh, languages so that they have that helper level. One of the languages we finish is C Sharp, and I'll, I have a fun C Sharp story a little bit later. Um, it involves um, stabbing uh, and uh, <laughs> that's of the way. Uh, I'm still uh, recovering from that. Um, README, so the README is so critical, just like Cristiano showed you guys, when someone comes to your site for the first time, 
that readme needs to explain really quickly how to get started and get them to the first API call as quickly as possible. So we did a survey and looked at so many different readmes, and we tried to collect the best practices from each one, but then go back as customer zero, like AD talked about earlier today, and think about, I'm coming into this uh, process for the very first time, does this make sense? And we use onboarding for this to help as well. When we have new send gridders come in, we find out what a language is their specialty, and we ask them to create an API call in their in the language and I love to sit actually physically with them and watch what they do. I've learned so much just watching them click around and going where they go because um, you can't just do that over um, email or text. It just it doesn't work. Um, getting started. Um, so after the README, we uh, looked, took a step back and said, you know what, we need to define a set of use cases to get people started quickly. Like there were certain things people did with our API that were just kind of common things. And we needed to make sure all those common things were defined and super, super easy. And so that's something you should look at is how do people get started with your API? And how can I make them get to that first API call as quickly as possible? So one of the things I liked about um, the OneNote API with Microsoft, they talked about that was a measurement that they tracked time to first API call. I love that. That's an awesome way to think about it. How quickly can you get them using the, your stuff? Um, troubleshooting docs. This is, um, use cake docs is, is basically an expansion of the getting started docs. So you'll start to get more questions from the community, more things that they wanna do with your API. You should have a document that describes all the most common use cases and how to do it in each one of the languages. And then troubleshooting docs, you know, you're gonna get several questions over and over again, and um, you know, you're gonna get tired of writing the same stuff over and over. So you wanna have troubleshooting docs that you can reference people over to. Um, and contributing docs. So obviously, when you're running a bunch of SDKs, one of the ways that we maintain this and maintain our sanity is by contributors. So you should make it as super simple as possible. So one of the ways is by dockerizing things, um, providing them with very simple ways to use the API, like using the Prism um, executable so that they can have a working version of SynGrid without even having an API key. It's little things like that that get people um, able to contribute and automating the, all of the Travis stuff so people don't, don't have to worry about that. Um, and the unit test, you know, with the unit test, you know, you, you want to lovingly craft those because you, you can't automate all the edge cases. You want to think through these things and have a, a real engineer sit down and try and figure those things out. Um, and then finally, your Simver versioning. Um, don't automate this because you'll probably make a mistake. It's easy to make mistakes even when you do this by hand. But, you know, people, and one of the things we found is a lot of people, they just ignore the Simver. They don't care that you did a breaking change and it broke their code. They're like, I don't care that you did a major version bump. Why did you break my code? So, um, you know, it's very important to be clear about how your versioning system works and to gain the trust of the developers to let them know if you have a minor uh, point change, you're not breaking their code. Um, so, community and collaboration, the good stuff. All right, so, let's see. One of the things that we did when we rewrote all of the libraries, everybody told us you need to do this collaboratively, right? So we put in big bold letters on each one of the repos in red. Um, Matt wouldn't let me do the animated GIF. I wanted to do the blink tag, but he wouldn't let me. Um, but we did that in all repos and we said, look, we're about to rebuild all this stuff. We're shaking it up. We want your feedback. This is your opportunity to help direct the future of our API. And then it was crickets. <laughs> Nobody said nothing. There was no comments at all. I don't even think there was even one comment. It was, it was just bad. But you know, obviously we couldn't just sit there and wait for somebody to say something. <laughs> so the best way to get um, feedback is you start deploying stuff, start breaking people's things. And boy, rabble, rabble, rouse, rouse, people, they woke up. I mean, we had some epic threads that were like 40 comments deep. I'm like, whoa, where do these people come from? We are looking for them earlier. So if you want to get <laughs> some comments, do a major breaking change, and you will definitely get it. But now what we found is um, once we've gone through this process, very important to document who are those vocal people and who are the contributors. And what we do now is when we want to make a change, we specifically call those people out. 
And it's amazing how fast they respond. Because when you call someone out specifically, it's like you're talking directly to them. You're giving them the respect that, hey, your opinion's important to me. I, I want to know, but like verses before, we're just kind of a blanket, everybody give us feedback. But now we're saying, you specifically, we want your feedback. And that's worked very well for us. Um, so just a couple of quick examples. Um, I call it dynamic gate um, or the stabbing because um, I, I, I think about um, what happened to Jon Snow when the watch um, came. I feel like that's what happened to me with several of these communities. Um, but what happened was, uh, so when we were automating the uh, processes, I grouped the different languages into two, to do, to two different buckets, dynamic type languages and statically typed languages. And somehow I thought C Sharp should go in the dynamic bucket. <laughs> no, don't do that. Uh, you will piss them off and it would be um, brimstone and fire. Um, that was one of the most interesting um, threads that I ever took part of. I mean, people, you know, they, they told me that I didn't deserve to be born and uh, all these sorts of things. And I, and, I, and I was like, maybe you're right. So I could start thinking, I questioned my, my life. I was like, damn it, maybe they're, they got something. But the thing that I learned from that whole process is that if someone's passionate enough to say such things, then listen to them. Um, if they tell you you suck, say, awesome. Why do we suck? <laughs> Tell me specifically. Like Cristiano, he told us some very specific things, and we're going to go back to our offices and get these things fixed. That's super valuable. That's huge. And that's what you want to do to all of the people. We had, um, so one of, one of the, the people in the .NET community, he decided that our stuff sucks so bad that he was just going to fork it and create his own version. And it was amazing because people started drawing toward his version and so we basically just copied what he did and brought him back into the fold and gave him the credit. And now he's constantly going in and solving issues before I can even do it. So you, you want to look for those, those powerful advocates who are very, you know, they, they know their language inside and out. You, you don't want to um, veto them just because they were negative in the beginning. Because sometimes they may have just been having a bad day. We've all had bad days and you're trying to get stuff done and you go to this API and they're doing things backwards. Of course you're going to be angry. Um, and then finally, another example is a gentleman um, uh, in uh, New Zealand. His name is Adam. He rewrote our entire Node.js library. Um, it was amazing, you know, and, and, you know, the first inclination may be, well, you know, this is my baby. I, I am the one that writes the library, but he wrote it, the community loved it, so he actually folded it directly back in, and he became, he's the main contributor of that library. So that sort of thing happens all the time. And final anecdote, there's a person on um, Twitter, he um, uh, basically told me um, I sucked and I should never program again, all sorts of crazy stuff. And so I reached out to him and I said, hey, I, I want to know exactly why do I suck? Tell me. And then um, we went back on Twitter a little bit. And then finally I said, you know what, let's, let's talk about it. Can you call me? And um, he told me later, we had a two-hour conversation, and he told me the only reason he talked to me is because he went to my GitHub profile and saw that I was managing a bunch of languages, so he felt a bit sorry for me. <laughs> and so... We talked for like two hours and he helped us tremendously understand where we had a whole bunch of shortcomings and there's no way I would have been able to do that without talking to him on the phone. Um, even though he was you know, in um, Australia, um, it, it, was, it was a beautiful thing. And if you could, the more you could do that, y your, your product would be, would be very, um, be much better. And Matt will talk a little bit more about this later because this is what he does now. He talks with developers day in, day out and we've learned so much from that effort. So how do we do all of these things? How do we prioritize all these things? Uh, Matt has an awesome uh, blog post called Double Your Velocity Without Growing Your Team with RICE. RICE is an acronym that means reach, impact, confidence, and effort. You should read the, um, his blog post where he references the intercom blog post that explains how it works. I definitely recommend, I'm running short on time, so you should definitely check that out for yourself, but it's how we manage everything. Short story is that we were using Jira before to manage our stuff, and what we found is that with backlog of 400, 500 items, you can't manage that effectively in JIRA. You can't know what's next. So we had to dump everything into a spreadsheet and apply this RICE formula so that we can see what's the next thing that we should be working on. Now, this other stuff, I think I'm going to save this for you because I just have one minute. But what I was uh, wanting to give you guys is a day in the life of what I do on a daily basis um, to give you an idea of um, 
how it's possible to manage all these things and all and the things I do in a typical day. So you'll have the slides later and, and you can ask me questions about any of these specific things. Um, but basically I do Pomodoro driven work. I have to be focused or else I cannot get these things done. And every day I have a certain list of things that I need to do that go beyond that backlog that I was talking about that gets prioritized. Because if I don't do these things then things will fall between the cracks and like things like, um, you know, turning in certain documents so I can get paid will not happen, and that's no good, right? Um, and then also um, a template that I use for meetings because since um, we don't have much time, meetings have to be super efficient. So we use this uh, meeting template to get things done. And then finally, at the end of the day, I have this checklist to make sure that I prepare for the next day so that as soon as I get back into the game the next day, ready to rock and roll. You gotta be super efficient when you're, when you're managing so many things. So even if you don't use my checklist, have a checklist, it'll, it'll save your sanity on those days when you have a whole bunch of people pinging you and needing your help. Um, that's it. Um, thank you very much. Enjoy lunch. And uh, yeah, I'm uh, Thinking Serious on Twitter. If you have any further questions, happy to, to help.